Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, our speaker today is Phil Brown. He's a, he studied physics and atmospheric physics at the Imperial College of London. He joined the Met Office in 1978, he discovered there that they operated a C-130 aircraft for atmospheric research, and so joined that group, the Meteorological Research Flight. His first work was on mountain wave dynamics over the UK. In 1983, he was introduced to the delights of cloud physics and airborne particle holography. He's continued to be involved with airborne cloud physical measurements since then, um, taking a short time out to learn a bit of cloud scale modeling at the Met Office group at the University of Reading. He took over the cloud physics group in what was soon to become the observation-based research in 2000. This group's interests are currently mainly connected to mixed phase cloud processes, some which he'll be talking about in this talk. And a large part of his time is also now devoted to the role of scientific coordinator for the UFAR research aircraft, the European, European facility for atmospheric research in Europe, and with which he's been involved since it got started in 2000. So with that, I'll introduce the group. Right, I'm told you can all hear me okay if I stand and speak at the microphone like this. Nods of agreement, good. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. I'm trying to remember when it was that I first visited NCAR, which was to come and visit Andy Hamesfield to talk about something to do with Cirrus observations, I think. It must have been about 1988, I think, so uh, it's good to be back. Um, so what I want to, to do here is just to um, uh, give a general rundown of, of some of the work that we do in this rather curiously named group in the Met Office, Observations Based Research, um, which is, is basically a group of people who work with both airborne and ground-based observations to study um, some important atmospherical, atmospheric physical processes and, and guide how those are represented in atmospheric models. So, moving on. Um, that's roughly what I want to talk about, who we are and what we do, um, to just run through some of the uh, more important things that we're doing at the moment in terms of developing airborne and ground-based instruments. Um, and then to say uh, just a little bit about some recent field campaigns that we've done. Um, I'm not actually going to be including much science in that. It's really just a very much a whistle-stop tour of a few, few of the interesting things that we've done and why we've been doing them. Uh, and then just to also to flag up a few of the, um, the major field campaigns that we've got um, on the sort of near and medium-term horizon. So uh, without further ado, this is um, observations-based research in the Met Office. Um, the main group is at Exeter. Uh, down in southwest England. Um, we've got three, uh, three groups really involved in the research work, cloud physics, atmospheric radiative transfer and aerosol studies. Um, and then another team of people that um, works on uh, a whole array of instrument developments that support all that work. Um, you can also see here that, that we support uh, what is called the Met Office Civil Contingency Aircraft. This was a um, the, the UK response to the volcanic ash incident in, in 2010. Um, so I'm not really going to say much more about this other than that it's, it's a small aircraft that is equipped with LIDAR and aerosol measurements to do operational monitoring of volcanic ash in any future incident. So, um, I mean, if any, anybody's interested to talk more about that afterwards, um, then I'm happy to do so. So I'm not going to say that much more about it here. Um, we have another team of people who actually works at FAM, which is the Facility for Airborne Atmospheric Measurements, which is based at Cranfield to the north of London, um, which is where our BAE 146 aircraft is actually operated. Uh, and then we have a, a field site at at Cardington, which is uh, actually quite close by Cranfield, just to the north of London, um, where they have a field site um, with a, a whole array of um, measurement masts, uh, a balloon which can carry instruments on the cable, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff which they can operate either at that site or, or take on, on various field deployments. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a little while. Um, so this is uh, this is the aircraft that we've been operating for um, 
uh, just about 10 years now in the UK. Um, the BA146 uh, operated at FAM. Um, just in within the last year, um, that aircraft has actually now been purchased by the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK. It used to be owned by BA Systems and, and leased to us. NERC has now bought it outright. And it's jointly funded and operated by um, NERC and the Met Office. Um, the Met Office flies about 200 hours per year on the aircraft, um, a lot of which is in collaboration with the various university um, research groups. We do a lot of work with um, Leeds and Manchester universities, for example, particularly Manchester um, in our own case, because they operate a lot of the newer um, cloud microphysics and aerosol measurements on the aircraft. Um, so as you can see, it carries uh, quite a, a large scientific crew and payload. The, the thing that actually hits us most of the time is the, um, the endurance of five and a half hours, which is not as much as we would like it to be, clearly, but it still enables us to do a lot of useful science around the UK and in, in uh, uh, one or two other interesting locations. Um, that's kind of what it looks like on the outside. You can see it's pretty comprehensively equipped. I won't run through all the detail here. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will, will recognize some of those instrument names. Um, the, uh, the bit that I'm most interested in, I suppose, is um, the uh, array of cloud physics and aerosol probes that we operate in um, various PMS canister installations on these underwing pylons. Um, so we can carry uh, eight standard PMS instrument canisters um, and uh, other instruments as well such as a, a spec cloud particle imager flies on the um, uh, on the pylon on the opposite wing so uh, pretty uh, pretty well equipped this is the uh, um, the Met research unit at Cardington the field site that I mentioned um, just a, uh, a run down there of, of some of the um, uh, the range of instruments that they're capable of operating. Uh, as I said, they've got um, balloon-mounted turbulence probes. These are separate little packages that you can string on a balloon cable so that you can operate maybe, um, maybe five of them at different heights on the balloon cable to do turbulence profiling through the boundary layer. Quite, uh, quite a nice piece of kit. The thing that I'm showing in the uh, in the pictures here is, is I think one of the one of the more interesting instruments that they've developed in the last few years, which is a dew meter for measuring uh, very low precipitation rates that you get in in dew or fog formation. Um, so it can measure um, with a precision of about 0 0.1 of a gram per square meter, um, which is you can see is considerably greater precision than you get from a typical tipping bucket rain gauge, for example. Um, so uh, um, a lot of the work that they do, uh, as you will see from the, uh, from the next slide, is uh, related to study of stable boundary layers, fog formation and dispersal. This is a, quite a hot topic at the moment in the UK because there's been a, a lot of recent incidents in, instances of uh, traffic disruption at London Heathrow Airport, which is, is very sensitive to fog, simply because it's so busy all the time. Um, any slight occurrence of fog can really screw it up there. So, um, you know, they're really interested in having us do better forecasts of fog formation, um, boundary layer cloud and visibility. So that's, that's pretty much the, the meat and drink of what they do at, uh, at the site at Cardington. So, uh, instrument development activities. Um, uh, so this is uh, really only a, a partial selection of, of what I thought were some of the, um, you know, the more immediately interesting things here. Um, and I should add that um, almost nothing that I'm talking about here this afternoon is, is my own work. It's, it's stuff that's being done by other people um, in, in the OBR team and I'll try and acknowledge them uh, wherever possible. So the first, uh, first item that I picked on is ISMAR, the International Submillimeter Airborne Radiometer. 
which is um, uh, a multiple multi-channel radiometer operating into the frequency range of several hundred gigahertz um, funded by the Met Office and ESA and with scientific collaboration from uh, the J Japanese Space Agency and a number of university groups in Europe as well. Um, that's currently being re-prepared, hopefully to fly on the aircraft next week, all being well, um, having been considerably delayed in its um, initial operation. Um, it's intended to be a, a satellite demonstrator type of instrument for a future space-borne ice cloud imager. Um, uh, and also as a, a technology demonstrator um, the uh, the channel that it will eventually have uh, in uh, above 800 gigahertz um, requires um, a certain amount of development of the detector technology still so that will be going ahead over the next few years um, and it's really uh, as, as I said it's uh, intended to provide a um, a, a global monitoring capability for ice cloud which is still um, you know, quite a, a live issue for understanding and monitoring the performance of, of global models so um, as it says these, uh, these frequencies up in the um, hundreds of gigahertz range in the submillimeter region are very sensitive to ice and liquid water um, and you can use them to get uh, direct estimates of the ice water path and ice particle size and shape information, which will be very useful to have on a, on a uniform global basis for um, basically testing the performance of, of global models. Um, so uh, this diagram just shows where... Uh, ISMAR will eventually have its full capability. Uh, these channels here in the 183 gigahertz region, that's part of our existing instrument, which is called MARS, um, which also has uh, some lower frequency channels as well. Uh, but then ISMAR goes into the um, sort of 220, 320, 400 and something, 670 something gigahertz that's going to be the highest frequency operating at the moment and as I said it will have um, channels operating in the 800 plus gigahertz region um, when it is developed to its full capability uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, this just kind of gives you some idea of um, the brightness temperature differences that you can get above a range of um, ice water contents uh, and as a function of um, different uh, frequencies here. So basically just shows that um, with, with a mix of channels like this you can basically have a capability that, that measures at quite high and quite low ice water contents which basically enables you to um, look at both um, physically thick and thin ice cloud layers um, so that's really why this represents a, a new capability I guess here is the um, instrument shown as a as a test installation on the aircraft um, and the diagram on the right here kind of shows the the layout so the the rotating uh, piece here is the rotating mirror and its stepper motor system so that, that basically directs uh, views from either the zenith, the nadir, or the hot and cold black body calibration targets into the array of receivers on the inside here. Um, this, this is actually the feature that gave us the most difficulty with its initial installation, because obviously this, this sits in a blister on the side of the aircraft, and it had open viewports both below and above um, for the instrument to view out of so uh, obviously you have um, uh, a large resonant chamber with open ports with air blowing past it makes a very good organ pipe 
um, and we had we had a lot of trouble with acoustic resonances in here, which were causing quite high vibration levels. Uh, you know, enough to cause some concern to our um, uh, aircraft certification people. So, so we had to go to quite a lot of trouble to to kind of solve that issue. We think we have it cracked now. So, hopefully, this will be uh, uh, in operation very shortly. Um, so, this is this is the um, the, the trial where it, we hope to fly it quite shortly soon from Presswick in Scotland uh, sub millimetre trial in Cirrus and Clear Skies um, that's really just intended as a, um, a kind of instrument shakedown really we're not expecting to get a lot of um, scientific data from that campaign it's really more to do with um, instrument characterisation uh, the, the first sam major scientific campaign will be this one Cosmics um, in March of next year based out in Canada and I'll uh, hopefully say a little bit more about that later so I'll skip on for now um, the next thing that I want to mention um, is our uh, a big new development that we're, we're putting into on aerosol instrumentation and that's a package called Excalibar um, now uh, this is being put together by Justin Langridge who used to be here in Boulder at NOAA uh, and he's, he's kind of building something similar to, um, to what he built and flew on the NOAA aircraft basically to um, uh, greatly improve our ability to measure aerosol absorption and extinction properties um, basically getting the optical properties right um, is uh, or better than we do at the moment um, is still a pretty big issue for uh, the climate modelling community getting the, the direct radiative properties of the aerosol right um, and that really needed a, a considerable upgrade of our instrumentation capability so that's, that's what we're trying to do um, so uh, this is being aimed at uh, a field campaign which you're calling, we're calling Clarify, and you're calling On Fire. I think I was reminded this morning. Um, so this is looking at biomass burning aerosols in the South Atlantic. Again, I'll hopefully say a bit more about that later. So um, this is kind of what will be in this package. There'll be cavity ring down aerosol extinction spectrometers operating at multiple wavelengths with relative humidity control. Uh, so that you can um, look at the um, response of aerosol to humid, changing humidity. There'll be um, photoacoustic measurements of the aerosol absorption properties, again at multiple wavelengths hopefully, and there'll be an optical particle counter or counters for dedicated accumulation mode size distributions. Um, as I said, that's, that's very much based on the work that, that Justin did at NOAA, um, this is just kind of a, a first sketch of how this is going to look on, on one of our instrument racks um, that will be inside the cabin of the 146 aircraft to give you um, an idea that's, that's like a, a double width 19 inch rack mounting system <coughs> the size of much of the bits and pieces unfortunately is, means that they're going to have to kind of sit in a box on top of that rack rather than being housed within it that's, that's kind of how things look at the moment so, uh, then the uh, the next major item, which is something that we've been working on for quite a long time, uh, and hope to finally get out of the door fairly soon, um, is an airborne ice nucleus counter. Um, I think there's, it's fair to say there's been a considerable growth of interest in making uh, airborne ice nucleus measurements in recent years. Basically, as as those measurements have become increasingly possible um, there's, there's been a, um, a lot of development both here in, in the US and by various groups in Europe as well um, and there have been uh, there are now some good facilities in Europe at the AIDA cloud simulation chamber for example where you can, um, you can bring all these different instruments and techniques together and intercompare them in a, a nice controlled way so um, uh, there's, there's nothing radically different about this instrument. It's a continuous flow diffusion chamber, um, following very much following the design of David Rogers. Um, uh, 
we've what we've done essentially is to put a lot of effort into um, maximizing the power and efficiency of the refrigeration systems to enable us to operate down to temperatures of about minus 35 Celsius in the sample region um, with, with good control and stability. I think that's really a, a key in this area. Um, to have a system for rapid re-icing of the chamber walls, obviously you have to have those covered with ice um, in order to maintain uh, or, um, the proper specification of uh, saturation with respect to ice in the sample region in the chamber. So you need to periodically get water in and then get it out quickly so that it just ices the walls but doesn't block up the chamber completely. Then the other thing that we wanted to do is to make the chamber as big as possible um, to give the maximum amount of growth time really for growing, growing ice crystals once they've been nucleated um, to um, improve the efficiency with which we can separate activated ice crystals from, from any residual large aerosol. And the chief constraint there is then making sure that it's a package that we can still get through the standard passenger door of a BAE 146. It's at this point that we, um, we retain a certain residual fondness for having um, a lowerable uh, you know, equipment loading ramp, uh, as for example on a C-130. Um, that would make it a lot easier to get this piece of equipment in and out of the uh, aircraft. Um, so it will be capable of operating at, at water saturation and it'll have a, um, a kind of downstream section in the chamber for evaporating those drops before we actually sample the the activated particles. We'll be using a, um, a particle phase detector from the University of Hertfordshire um, as, as the particle detector and counter and for those of you who know about these things that's, that's kind of equivalent to the detector that flies in the SID3 instrument. It basically records the, the full scattering pattern um, from uh, any particle that passes through its sampling region. We're still hoping that it will go on the aircraft during 2015 for the ICE-D campaign coming up um, in about August or September of that year. Uh, again, I'll say a little more about that uh, in a little while. Um, that's kind of how it'll look, um, fitting on two racks. Um, so here's the, the actual sample chamber here with two racks full of refrigeration equipment basically on the side um, and then some systems over in the other rack for um, basically doing all the airflow control that you need, uh, bringing the sample in, conditioning it, drying it and so on um, and passing it to the top of the chamber. Um, so our only remaining concern is that, uh, that these racks are going to be approaching their maximum weight limit for installation on the aircraft. So uh, that's that's kind of the remaining uncertainty really in this development. So, uh, so uh, recent field campaigns. Um, the first one that I want to mention, uh, I thought would be interesting, is, is one that we did actually over here um, from Tucson, Arizona about a couple of years ago, um, which was called Solstice for semi-arid land surface temperature and IASI calibration experiment. And the thing that was driving that really was um, uh, a particular issue with our operational global numerical model, the unified model, um, where uh, through the, the dry months of the season particularly, we were seeing large biases in the surface temperature in semi-arid regions. So that's pretty much characteristic of of all such regions uh, around the world, that you can see those temperatures would, those temperature biases would exceed um, 10 Kelvin during the daytime, uh, you know, becoming much better at night. So, um, uh, clearly, there are a range of possible potential issues with the model physics. Um, to do with possibly the land surface scheme or um, some aspect of satellite data assimilation um, 
which could be contributing to this and that was um, uh, clearly what our driving interest was. Um, clearly one of the things that we do in the Met Office is still to provide forecasts to um, the defence sector in the UK um, who tend to operate still in a lot of semi-arid regions around the world um, and this kind of thing could have uh, quite a significant impact on their interests so that was another reason why it was important to do this particular campaign. Um, so uh, we spent about three weeks uh, in May of 2013 it says here, I thought it was 2012, okay 2013, uh, based in Tucson um, where there was uh, um, a simultaneous ground based campaign with some flux towers set up uh, soil and near surface temperatures and humidities, uh, turbulence and radiation flux measurements at the surface. Um, one tower was also fitted with three infrared uh, imaging systems uh, looking at an array of objects on the ground um, for helping to evaluate this system called NEON which is a um, basically a forecasting scheme that we use for predicting uh, contrast of imaging systems in the thermal infrared. Um, so we did a number of aircraft sorties on this campaign, some of them uh, based on um, uh, this particular interest of, of looking at the issue of land surface temperatures in the unified model, um, flying a, a number of low and medium altitude mapping patterns essentially over these ground sites. Um, and then we also did uh, a number of flights underflying the uh, IASI uh, interferometer sounder on the polar orbiting satellites uh, just to do some uh, further contributions to uh, CalVal with those instruments. Um, I don't, don't have much to, uh, in particular to show in terms of results from that model but just to show um, it was a good opportunity to do that field campaign at that time in that location because simultaneously we were operating um, two different versions of our unified model with 2.2 and 4.4 kilometre grid resolution. That was part of a, um, an intercomparison called the hazardous weather test bed um, which was, was basically intercomparing the performance of a number of, of operational and semi-operational numerical models. Um, across the central US, particularly for, for looking at their performance in, in predicting intense convective precipitation. So we were, we were running those models anyway, um, so it was a good opportunity to intercompare their performance on this issue um, uh, with, with the global model. And the, the particular point to notice really is, is that both of those regional kilometre scale models um, had significantly reduced temperature biases um, compared to the global model. Um, those were run without any land surface data assimilation. So I think the point to take is there that in the global model the problems are to do with both the representation of physical processes at the surface so that, that remains in, um, in the regional scale models and also there's, there's some issue with the, the, the data assimilation scheme which is also having an impact. Um, so basically analysis of all this stuff is still going on. Uh, so um, hopefully uh, reporting on that in a year or so. Um, the next one I'll talk about is, is a project that we also did last year in 2013 called COPE, um, Convective Precipitation Experiment very imaginative title there, um, to study the production of precipitation in organised convective systems over southwest England um, and again to look at the exploitation of data that's used in operational or semi-operational convective scale data assimilation um, and hopefully to do something to improve the representation of microphysical processes in operational kilometre scale NWP thereby hopefully leading to um, improvements in quantitative precipitation forecasting. Um, 
<coughs> this was built basically off the back of a, um, a particularly severe flash flooding event that occurred about 10 years ago now down in some uh, small communities on the um, on the north coast of Cornwall, which is down in the far southwest of England, um, from what was quite an innocuous looking line of convection that formed along a sea breeze front there. Um, the, the individual cells themselves weren't particularly intense, but because they were, um, they were confined in a line, a small river catchment was exposed to um, quite intense precipitation over a long period, and that produced an extremely dramatic flash flood. Um, so that was, that was kind of what was, was driving our interest here. Um, so uh, this was a, a big international campaign that brought quite a lot of teams together. So we obviously had the FAM aircraft uh, operating, and we had the University of Wyoming King Air over. Um, I think this is quite an old picture now, because I know the color scheme's different, but I think this is, this is one that I took myself when we were also flying together out in... Uh, uh, out in Rico in Antigua a few years ago now. So, um, so we had the King Air team on board with the, uh, the Wyoming Cloud Radar and Cloud LiDAR, um, a superb facility to have in a, a joint campaign like this. Um, we did actually fly the, the Mocha civil contingency aircraft on a couple of scientific flights. Um, it's equipped with... Um, um, fairly rudimentary dynamical and thermodynamical measurements, so we did actually use it to do a bit of boundary layer mapping, um, locating the position of the, uh, the sea breeze fronts on a couple of occasions. Um, we had uh, a new facility, which is this transportable uh, X-band Doppler radar here, operated by the um, National Centre for Asm Atmospheric Science in the UK. Um, it's shown here in front of its uh, larger fixed cousin, which is the large radar at Chill Bolton in the UK, for, for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, this is uh, a really useful new facility because you can tow it around to different locations in the UK. So we had it operating at a, a fixed site down there in the middle of the um, operational Met Office weather radar network. Um, we had the Met Office Operational Weather Radar Network here, um, one station at North Devon, another one further over here in the west of England. Unfortunately, this one down on the tip of Cornwall was, was out of action during the campaign because it was um, actually being uh, upgraded with its polarisation capability, um, so that wasn't available to us. But the, uh, the, the NCAS radar operated from a site here on the edge of... Um, this kind of upland area, which is called Bodmin Moor. Um, and then we also had our colleagues from uh, the Met Research Unit at Cardington operating both additional radio sons operating from, from here at Davidstow, and they were also operating their Doppler LiDAR in their instrumented van that they have, and the University of Manchester was operating a um, a surface aerosol measuring site also here on site at, at Davidstow. So quite a, quite a large array of instrumentation that we were able to put together to, to study organised convective precipitation. Um, we had a, a plan for doing lots of different types of aircraft flight, either penetrating single cells like this and, and following their evolution or, or finding lines of organised convection and, and um, flying a, along the line essentially to sample cells that were at different stages of their evolution. Um, the thing that we really suffered from in this campaign was that it was one of the best summers that we've had for the last 10 years and we went for about a month without any precipitation whatsoever um, which um, was somewhat frustrating to say the least. However we did eventually get some, um, some nice case studies and, and here's just one of them to show the sort of um, the sort of event that we were trying to look at. So um, when you have winds roughly from the southwest here down over Cornwall, you kind of get a sea breeze front that, that sets up along the north coast there. 
Um, and if the wind is exactly in the right direction, that, that can be kind of quasi-static along the coast here, um, or it can swing a bit further inland and give you something like this, where you've got organised convective cells that are going right off down um, uh, over the rest of the UK and producing some quite intense precipitation as they do. Um, so this was, uh, this was, I say, one of the uh, one of the nice events that we eventually got. Um, you can see in the satellite image here, this one actually showed signs of perhaps almost two separate lines of convection, um, with with sea breeze fronts penetrating from both coasts. Um, we're, you know, still trying to do some of the analysis on these events to see if that was really what was going on. But that's kind of what it looked like at the time. Um, this just shows. The, the capability of the uh, the NCAS radar there. Um, uh, these uh, essentially look like range height scans. Actually, the radar um, spent all its time doing plan position scans at different elevations, but because it was able to do um, a full sequence of those scans quite quickly, <coughs> it meant that you could extract sort of pseudo range height scans to look at any individual cells that you had in the target area. So that's what this is kind of showing. Um, we were quite surprised by the high reflectivities that we would see at, at quite low altitudes in this system. And, and that, together with the, uh, uh, the large positive ZDR values here, is indicative of quite vigorous warm rain processes going on in these clouds. So, so the interest from the microphysical point of view is going to be very much about the, the interaction between supercooled raindrops, glaciation, splinter production, possibly from drop freezing, um, possibly from the Hallett-Mossop process, because um, a lot of subsequent growth of ice particles is, is going on within the temperature range of the Hallett-Mossop process. So uh, again, just a, an illustration there of the, the the kind of capability that we had to look at these clouds and use the ground-based radar basically to direct the aircraft onto suitable targets. Um, so um, this, this is just one small part of this case study that, that shows um, three penetrations that we were able to make through one isolated cell forming along this line. You can see here we're, we're flying with a, a slight um, crosswind orientation basically so that we could concentrate on, on penetrating this single cell. Um, here's just some of the measurements that, uh, that we got from that single cell. Um, you know, quite solid updraft cores um, exceeding 8 metres per second here. We certainly saw values as high as um, 12 or 13 metres per second in the strongest updrafts. Um, this uh, you know, this looks like a fairly classic case with a um, an updraft that's mostly supercooled water and ice in the downdraft region, um, probably just on the down shear side of that. Um, these are the two subsequent penetrations that kind of just show how that evolves a bit. A um, bit more ice appearing in this one. Um, the updraft still about the same magnitude, um, and then on the subsequent pass. Um, Things are getting a little bit more mixed up here in terms of, of the updraft structure, but still quite a clear signature of, of an unglaciated updraft and, and ice forming downstream. So um, I'm not trying to say that you know there's nothing about here about that that's that's particularly common to to any of the events. Um, there'll be be other cells that, that look completely different, but basically um, you know we 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 have a good set of in situ measurements here. Um, one thing that surprised us, I think, perhaps, was, was the magnitude of the liquid water contents that we're seeing in, in these cells, um, getting up to be quite comparable with the, the adiabatic liquid water content. Um, so um, we think some of that may be due to the fact that, that these, these are clouds that are forming in a line, so they're tending to mix with each other rather than an unsaturated environment. So that's perhaps something that helps them keep high liquid water contents. Um, we were also quite surprised, I think, to see such high 
cloud droplet concentrations. Um, th I mean, these, as I said, these are, these are winds from the southwest, so they're very much uh, <coughs> clean maritime air that we're seeing down there. Um, but nevertheless, drop concentrations reaching several hundred per cubic centimetre. Um, however, clearly these were quite vigorous updrafts, so there is at least the possibility of, of nucleating um, large droplet concentrations. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of this sort of thing before, um, just you know, to show that this was the sort of additional capability that we had um, with uh, having the King Air available. Um, this was actually uh, an event that was the previous day to the, the system that I just showed, where um, basically we, we messed up on the forecasting and chose not to fly the BAE on this day. We thought, oh, it doesn't look very exciting, we'll just fly the King Air. Uh, it turned out to be the best day we'd had so far in the campaign, but you know, at least we had one aircraft up there doing something, um, which was very useful. Um, so you can see quite a nice uh, updraft structure here with, with downdrafts either side, um, reaching, as I said, 30 metres per second in this case, um, and uh, you know, quite frequent occurrence of millimetre-sized droplets in the middle of that cloud, as I said, indicating a, um, a very efficient warm rain process going on uh, at lower levels in the cloud. Uh, we have now run, uh, and this is some work that's been done by um, Kirsty Hanley and Humphrey Lean at the Met Office Group at Reading. Um, Kirsty has run for, for each case study that, sh that we've done uh, a complete set of um, test runs of the unified model at resolutions of 500 metres, 200 metres and 100 metres for comparison with the operational um, what's called the operational UKV model, which runs at one and a half kilometres resolution. Um, and you can see, obviously, very different um, structures in the simulated convection there with, with the highest resolution runs, um, perhaps doing what we would expect them to do, to do a lot of unrealistic, very spotty convection. Um, I mean, this is very much a live issue um, in, in other contexts in, in the unified model development is is basically adapting uh, parameterization schemes so that they work well down at these high resolutions. These, um, I think, in these models have not been so well adapted, which is why you still see quite a lot of spotty convection like that. Um, and just to show how that compares in terms of domain average rain rates, um, the black curve here is the analysis from the operational radar um, and you can see that on this occasion, perhaps the um, the 500 meter resolution model run is perhaps doing the best in terms of predicting the the time evolution and the magnitude um, of that precipitation, uh, getting both of those quantities right. The um, the higher resolution models um, look okay during the the peak period of production from that line but then they also produce excessive production at other times so that's that's when they're doing too much precipitation from shallow convection I think um, but clearly this is um, this is going to be an ongoing area of analysis basically to to look at what what's the balance really between microphysics and model resolution in getting quantitative precipitation correct from this type of system um, so in spite of getting off to a bad start, we did, uh, we did eventually sample a good range of cases. We did some, some cloud-free sea breeze fronts. We did some uh, organized convective lines that were unglaciated, just doing warm rain processes. And then we got some that were doing rain and ice. So <coughs> actually, across all of those, it gives us quite a good opportunity to test all of the, the aspects of the model um, that we, that, that we think will be important, looking at all the different um, science questions that we, that we wanted to address. Warm rain is clearly a very important contributor to surface precipitation in these sort of systems over the UK. Um, but we did notice distinct differences in the cloud evolution, even between 
clouds which form in, in quite similar thermodynamic profiles and, and that's looking at the contrast just between these, these um, two days one after the other. There are, uh, whilst there's a lot in common with those events, there's also some, some significant differences that's been seen as well and, and exploring what's the, the underlying cause of that is part of what we'll be doing. Um, so looking at the impacts of cloud organisation on entrainment and warm rain formation, ice initiation, secondary ice nucleation processes, um, all of those are, are going to be important areas of future study. Um, the unified model simulations, as I said, typically at the moment, the, um, typically produce excess area average rain and we want to look at the, as I said, the relative impacts of resolution and microphysics there and, and getting that right. Um, here's another area of, of interest at the moment which is looking at um, at cloudiness in cold air outbreaks um, so we've done a couple of field campaigns called constrain and pick mix this kind of shows the situation this is a, a MODIS satellite image that, that shows a, a cold air flow down to the east of Iceland which is up about here and the north of Scotland is down here somewhere and you can see this the, the transition between stratiform cloud and basically in, in open cells um, which isn't really represented in the operational model here. This is just showing long wave flux to show where, um, uh, where the model thinks cloud is. And it has a lot of basically open cell cloudiness throughout this region. Um, on this particular case, you could play around with the model boundary layer scheme and make it do something which, which looked a little bit more like the observations. I'll, uh, I'll perhaps say a little bit more about that in a minute, but, but this, this, this kind of um, failing of the model is, is thought to be at least um, one contributor to the, the known problems that a lot of climate models have um, in their surface radiation budget and, and sea surface temperatures down in the Southern Ocean. Um, so uh, it's something that we're putting a lot of time into continuing to study. Um, this is just another case that we did uh, coming up for three years ago now. Um, a similar kind of event, um, cold air coming down to the east of Iceland, and we were able to, to do a, a kind of double flight flying from the north of Scotland up to um, Keflavik in Iceland, doing some in situ measurements along the way, and then flying back over the top of the system, monitoring the cloud distribution with uh, our airborne aerosol LIDAR. Um, in this case, um, both the control model and the model with the modified boundary layer scheme both failed to produce the observed um, stratiform cloudiness. So, um, you know, we know that the, the fix for this problem is, is not simple. Whilst you can, you can tune one model simulation to produce the right results, that's obviously not a general solution in all cases. Um, this just kind of shows some of the detail measurements. I won't spend a lot of time looking at this. Um, you know, these are these are clean cloud cases, drop concentrations of a few tens per cubic centimetre. Um, whilst we we generally get the boundary layer properties about right in the lower levels, as as is normal, we we're unable to get sharp inversions at the top of the boundary layer, um, or sharp hydrolapses in the same region um, and if anything the the surface humidity values tend to be a bit on the high side compared to the measurements uh, <coughs> what that leads to is um, we get an underestimate both of the liquid water content and and the ice water content in these regions um, you know, basically the model is, is getting a lot of the structure right, the wind velocities are about right for example, um, but there's, there's clearly, um, clearly some things to be sorted out which probably have um, as much to do with surface flux parameterizations as anything to do with the, um, the microphysics and that's kind of just shown here. Um, uh, these are just some turbulent flux measurements that we were able to make uh, in that uh, that particular case study that I just showed, um, we're getting the heat flux profile about right, and the model with the modified boundary layer process 
also gets that about right. Um, but um, some uncertainties about what's going on with the turbulent moisture flux uh, near the surface. We're measuring significantly higher values uh, than what the model is producing. So that probably has to do with um, the, uh, the, the surface moisture difference in, in the modified boundary layer model is still too low, therefore it's, it's getting insufficient moisture flux. Um, moving on to some forthcoming campaigns. Um, uh, I said I'd mention this one coming up. This is COSMIC's Cold Air Outbreak and Submillimeter Ice Cloud Study. So this is, this is the usual thing we do of trying to combine two or three different interests in a field campaign to make sure that we come back at, with at least some data that will suit one of them. Um, so we're going to be spending about three weeks of March 2015 at uh, Goose Bay, in Labrador, um, with, with plenty of flight hours. Um, I think we can fly two days out of three at the very least um, with, with all that available. Um, so the aims will be uh, to, do, to try and do some um, observations with more scientific intent to evaluate the performance of the ISMAR radiometer um, in both um, clear and cloudy sky conditions, um, focusing mainly on, uh, on some cirrus. The reason for, for going to um, a nice cold place like this is, is to hopefully um, get a, a lower tropopause than we habitually see in the UK, where we might be able to get the, the aircraft over the top of the cirrus. Um, obviously very important for, for testing the performance of the instrument as a, as a future satellite instrument to be able to look down on the cloud. Um, and uh, hopefully to get some data that will be coincident with uh, a train and METOP satellite overpasses. Um, we'll also be taking the opportunity of being in that part of the world to look at um, uh, hopefully some cold air outbreaks over the, uh, the Labrador Sea region um, and to do some more of those measurements looking at surface fluxes, boundary layer structure, cloud processes, uh, and let's say, you know, try and help to address this, um, um, this mixed phase cloudy issue that we think is affecting the Southern Ocean. Um, so that's the area we think we're going to be operating in. Goose Bay is, is round about here somewhere. Um, we hope we're going to have the possibility to fly up to Iqaluit and Baffin Island here uh, to do a refuel to give us a somewhat longer duration so that we can possibly sample the cloud uh, <coughs> quite close to the sea ice edge in that region. Uh, we also hope to have the possibility of of flying over the sea ice in Hudson Bay, assuming that's still around at that time of year, um, to do some um, ice surface measurements with the, the whole suite of microwave and submillimeter instruments in, in clear skies. So again, quite a, a, a campaign with quite a broad range of interests there. Uh, ice D I mentioned before, um, this is uh, something that I'm sure Andy Hainsfield knows a lot about already. It's It's kind of originates from a whole um, set of field campaigns called ICE something or other, looking at processes of ICE initiation in a, a variety of um, types of cloud. The intention here is very much to look at the impact of, of dust aerosols as, as ICE nuclei. So um, all being well, we'll be going to the Cape Verde Islands for three to four weeks in August or September 2015, yet to be decided. Um, with this possibly being the precursor to further field campaigns in later years with uh, perhaps with the NCAR aircraft. Um, there will be uh, again a ground based component of this based at the Cape Verde Atmospheric Observatory so there will be um, some more aerosol instrumentation operated on the ground by uh, the University of Manchester um, and there will be simultaneous work going on in the uh, AIDA chamber in Germany looking at uh, uh, um, properties of some of the dust. Um, we will be running uh, operational hopefully dust forecasts um, so that will hopefully give us a steer on, on where to plan our flights. Um, this kind of just shows uh, um, 
sort of the situation that we hope to get. Here's a nice dust plume extending uh, off the coast of Africa. Um, Cape Verde Islands are, are kind of well placed to get on the fringes of that. Um, uh, Richard Cotton and others in the Met Office have been been looking at a, a month or two's worth of um, uh, satellite images and dust dispersion forecasts for August and September of this year to um, to go through kind of planning exercises for where we would fly on on on, on given days, um, and it looks as though there will be plenty of opportunity to do something useful, either just monitoring the dispersion of the dust plume looking at cloud formation in industry regions but hopefully also finding occasional regions where where the where the dust plume is interacting with the cloud formation and, and looking at the at the different impact that it will have um, clearly the objectives as I said looking at aerosol cloud interactions and and dust in the um, in the Met Office unified model that is being developed with a new interactive um, Microphysics and aerosol scheme, which is based on this, um, uh, what's called UKCA, UK Chemistry and Aerosol Scheme, um, which is a much more sophisticated scheme for representing dust, sea salt, uh, biomass, and anthropogenic aerosols in in a lot more detail in the model. Um, therefore, with um, the opportunity, um, if we can. Uh, um, determine the ice nucleating properties of those dust aerosol um, we can use them as a, um, uh, a prognostic system for ice crystal concentrations so clearly the aim is to see are IN measurements reliable in themselves and are they a reliable predictor of cloud ice concentrations um, so big objectives there I think I just want to get back to our, our ground based team and, and give them a mention again um, they've actually spent the last couple of months or so setting up a big campaign on the ground um, on uh, the kind of Welsh borders region in the, in the county of Shropshire on the, on the border between England and Wales um, to do a big study of forma fog formation that will actually span two winters um, this coming winter season and the one following looking at radiation fog formation over complex orography uh, and also continuing to look at fog formation over flat terrain back at their field site at, uh, at Cardington. So they've been busy setting up a, a network of uh, instrumented masts including uh, a couple I think that are um, extendable to 50 metres and then uh, a whole lot of fog monitoring automatic weather stations across this, this Ridge Valley system. Um, which is kind of shown here it doesn't show up perhaps very well but this kind of is a little topographic map with this whole network of uh, automatic weather stations um, in this area of complex terrain and you can see here uh, this is um, basically elevation on the vertical axis <coughs> and just uh, Longitude, so horizontal position west to east on here. So, you know, we can we span both the the, the ridge tops and the valleys, and here's one of those ridge top automatic weather station sites that's been set up. Um, so this is quite a major initiative for this team of people. They've spent a lot of time setting up these stations, and they're going to be busily involved going around them every month or so just making sure that they're serviced and operating properly and clean and all of that kind of thing and making sure that their data is getting back and being archived correctly um, so uh, this is a pretty major study uh, over the horizon um, these are kind of things that are coming up sort of two years ahead um, there's a possibility of a big campaign in India in 2016 looking at aerosol interactions during the onset and evolution of the Indian monsoon um, this is is kind of coming out of a big strategic collaboration between Natural Environment Research Council and the Indian Meteorological Agency um, possibly in the same year uh, there's this clarify campaign or on fire for the US 
uh, involvement looking at biomass burning aerosols and cloud microphysical interactions in the southeast Atlantic. Um, we're looking at involvement in uh, a field campaign as part of the year of polar prediction, which will possibly between about 2017 and 2019, uh, looking at process studies and model evaluation in polar regions. Um, and we're also currently scoping what involvement we might have in something that's been called the year of maritime continent. Uh, again, looking at processes involved in uh, convective cloud formation and precipitation and uh, the diurnal cycle of precipitation and the impacts that that has on the representation of things like the Madden Julian oscillation in global models. Um, a whole, whole big area of potential involvement uh, that could spin out of that. And we're really just trying to kind of scope what, uh, what our involvement in that is going to be. And I think. Yes, that's it. So I'm sorry I've gone on perhaps a bit over time there, but uh, um, hopefully that's given you a, a fairly good picture. Thank you, Phil. Any questions for Phil? Um, some Quite some years ago when I visited the flight facility, my feeling was that each of the scientists there kind of had to look at one thing and come up with a parameterization of based on some observations per year. One paper per year writing uh, a parameterization that could be bolted into a model, basically. Are you still having requirements like that, or is it far more loosely now? Um, oh, I think it's, uh, it's a little more sane than that, I think, now. Um, I think, I mean... Um, I th it's, we're, we're quite fortunate, I think, now that we have uh, both the, the main aircraft observing team and the p parameterization development teams located in the same building at Exeter that, you know, we do actually talk to each other. Um, um, uh, I mean, Paul Field, who I'm sure many of you here are familiar with, um, used to work on the observational side working with the aircraft he now runs the group that is responsible for developing the um, the, the microphysics parameterization scheme in the unified model so we do actually have the opportunity to work quite closely together and um, uh, certainly uh, people from his team will be coming out on the ISD field campaign for example and um, you know really participating at that level so I think it's it's much more collaborative now, and um, <clears throat> you know, as long as as long as the papers get written by somebody in some sort of collaborative form, that's that's fine. And, and, the, and as long as we show that the the observational work eventually has an impact on improving the model performance, clearly, if it doesn't, there's no point in in doing the work. So. Thank you, Phil, for this very nice overview of the activities. At least two of the things that you've shown um, have prompted me to, to ask you this question, um, such as trying to measure fluxes in cold air outbreaks in the very miserable conditions and trying to uh, improve forecast of fog. So the question comes, <laughs> um, anywhere within the plans of the observational group, uh, Met Office, NERC, to do any UAV measurements? Where do UAVs fall within your map of observational assets? Uh, I, I mean, I can at least say truthfully that, that the Met Office does have some involvement in, in UAVs now. The, the group at Cardington, I didn't actually mention it there, but, but they are <clears throat> at the level of investigating the use of this sort of UAV you know, um, small electrically powered, um, very short range, um, kind of line of sight type flying. Um, because it potentially gives them something that they can use for um, doing very simple temperature and humidity profiling near the ground, perhaps in, in stable boundary layer conditions, that will be useful to do. Um, that's it at the moment. Um, I mean, clearly, um, 
UAVs sound good because you think, ah, oh, unmanned aircraft, you don't need any men. Um, I, I was at a, a conference on research aircraft operations at the Royal Aeronautical Society in London just a couple of weeks ago, and there was a, um, there was a guy from the, uh, the team at NASA Armstrong describing the, the Global Hawk facility. And clearly, you know, that's, that's unmanned in the sense that nobody flies on the aircraft, but there's, there's a hell of a lot of people involved in its operation, and it's not cheap. Um, so uh, I don't know. I think it's, um, it's, it's very much something that I want to explore with my UFAR interest, really, because UFAR started out as, um, you know, as a, as a manned aircraft network, but, but clearly you can't avoid talking about UAVs now because there is, it's just an area of, of exploding interest and, and capability as well, I think. That's the, that's the main point. So, you know, understanding how you integrate uh, UAVs and, and manned aircraft observations, it's something that we will have to talk about, but we're not perhaps doing it at the moment. You mentioned the uh, looking for the Halton Moss process in some of the clouds. Have you been able to look at the uh, that with radar at all in terms of looking, for example, at the needle growth regime and that uh, is often associated with that? Um, I, th I think that's something that we will be trying to explore uh, with the you know the polarization capability of the radars that that w were available. It's not. Um, the capability is there yet, but the analysis is still ongoing. Um, I think it's safe to say. Um, we've certainly, um, just just skimming through the microphysical data, um, there is at least circumstantial evidence that the the Hallett Mosser process was active in some of these clouds simply because you see, um, you know, high concentrations of small columns. I think seeing what the <coughs> what the radar view is of those clouds um, and, and then hopefully um, you know the radar always gives you perhaps more of a, a, a more of a 3d structure then um, to to put those in situ measurements into some kind of context I think that's really what we want to do For COPE, you mentioned that one of the objectives was to improve the uh, assimilation of, of data into the predict prediction model. Mm -hmm. um, does that include assimilation of the radar data, uh, the uh, cloud radar data? Uh, yes, it does. And they're also working on uh, assimilating line of sight Doppler velocities, which pretty much all of our operational network radars will shortly be able to supply. Um, I mean, clearly, that is giving you line of sight Doppler velocities where the precipitation is already occurring. Um, I think the, the the predictive capability in in these sort of um, you know linear convergence events would come if you could see where the convergence line was before convective precipitation was already occurring. Um, so we don't clearly have that capability at the moment. Unless perhaps we can get it at it from, uh, you know, these are, these are summertime events, so you always get insects in the boundary layer, for example, and we might be able to pick up insect convergence as a, as a diagnostic of, of where those lines are forming. Any last questions for Phil? If not, let's thank him again. Thank you. Thank you.